Muévete, try that. Muévete, muévete. And then the second time is Muévete, muévete. Try that. Muévete, muévete. And so I, the, the way that part of the song goes, Tu le dirías, this is my part, La montaña. Muévete, muévete. Tu le dirías, a La montaña. Your part. Muévete, muévete. All right, you're halfway there. And then the other part that you need to, that, that you need to know is, Se montaña se moverá. And you guys sing, Se moverá, se moverá. Try that. Se moverá, se moverá. My part. Esa montaña se moverá, se moverá, se moverá. 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 And what this song means is, if you even have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to the mountain, "Move," and it will move. Can I get an amen? Tuvieras fe como un grano de mostaza. Esto lo dice el Señor. Si tuvieras fe como un grano de mostaza. Esto lo dice el Señor. Tú le darías a la montaña. Your part. Muévete, muévete. Tú le darías a la montaña. Again. Muévete, muévete, esa montaña se moverá, se moverá, se moverá, 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 si tuvieras fe como un grano de mostaza, esto lo dice el Señor. Si tuvieras fe como un grano de mostaza, esto lo dice el Señor. Tú le darías a la montaña. Your part. Muévete, muévete. Tú le darías a la montaña. Again. Muévete, muévete. Esa montaña se moverá, se moverá, se moverá. Esa montaña se moverá, se moverá. Moverá, esa montaña se moverá, se moverá, moverá, esa montaña se moverá, se moverá, se 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 moverá. Light of the moon, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see beauty that made this heart adore. Hope of a life spent with you. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. King of all days. King of all this, oh so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. Only you came to the earth you created, all full of sin became poor. So 
here I am. So here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're mine. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. And I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. And I'll never upon that cross and I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross and I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that bow down here I am to say that you're my you're all together lovely all together worthy all together wonderful to me I think we often think that two of the most powerful words we can, or three of the most powerful words we can tell someone is I love you, which I think in many ways is, uh, is one of the greatest things we can tell someone or we can tell God, but I wonder if the phrase, here I am, is an even more powerful phrase to say. And I'm not sure why each and every one of you uh, is here, uh, but God has a very powerful reason for you to be here, and I think uh, as we continue to kick off this conference, one of the most powerful things you could say back to him, uh, like we read in the book of Isaiah, when God says, whom shall I send to say the three simple words, here I am, here I am. Just spend a moment if you want to bow your head or just uh, be with God and just say that over and over again to him. Here I am, God. Here I am.
Maybe you're coming into this conference on a high that God's been doing powerful things in and through your life and through your ministry, and you're just here to celebrate. But maybe you're here and you feel uh, beaten down, you feel broken. But behold, God wants to do a new thing. Let's take a moment and ask God to begin to speak to us. What does God want to teach us this week? What does God want to speak to our hearts? Is it something for our ministry? Is it something for our souls? Lord, open the eyes of our hearts. We want to see you. We want to hear you. Speak to us. Do a new thing in us. I want to see you. 
Cause I want to see you Open the eyes of my heart Open the eyes of my heart Open the eyes of my heart I want to see you Yes, I want to see you and Who am I that you are mindful of me? That to hear me when I call. Is it true that you are mindful of love me? That you love me? It's amazing. Who am I? Who am I? That you are mindful of me that you hear me when I call is it true is it true that you are thinking of me that you love me it's amazing it's God, I am a friend of God, I am a friend of God, He called me prayer over and over, so I am a friend of God, I am a friend of God, I am a friend of God, He called me God, we are here to say powerful words and to hear powerful words. Here we are, Lord. Open the eyes of our heart. Remind us that we are your friends. We are here to celebrate who you are. We are here to learn from who you are. And we are here to become more like who you are. We give ourselves to you as much as we know how. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Okay, you got it on? It's working now. Okay. There's a passage that says... Uh, <laughs> did it go off again? Pray, pray. Okay. You say you want me to pray? Yeah. <laughs> okay. There's a passage that says that God has exalted his word. Are you hearing it? No. no. Something is wrong here. Do you have another one? Okay, I'm going to try this for the last time. <laughs> okay. Okay. There's a passage that says that, that God has exalted his word above his name. We really want CCDA to be the association of people 
who are trying to live out the word trying to put the word into action, really trying to order our steps by his word. And that's what CCD is really about. It's not just being hearers of the word, but we're attempting to obey God and become doers of the word. And James said it's, it's not the hearers of the word that will be a blessing to others, but the doers of the word will be a blessing to others. And that's what we want to do. We, we also want to have a sense of our own uh, religious tradition and heritage. The best of the tradition and the best of heritage. And what I want to also do, when, I started, when we started this ministry, uh, uh, when, 18 years ago, it wasn't many people who was reflecting upon our movement. My books was like some of the first books that was really trying to speak to this holism, this whole, taking a whole gospel on a whole mission to the whole world. And that's what we want CCDA to be. And, and so we want you to also write. I want to make this Bible study here in the morning the, the study of the Bible, but we also want to get you reflecting and writing books and writing books, reflecting and writing books to, so that people 50, 100 years from now, whenever, will know that there was a movement going and they can go back and reflect upon what we was doing during that period of time. We need to be conscious of that. And so what I've done this today, so every morning now, I'm going to introduce a couple of people who wrote books. Now you write your book, come to me. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and I'm going to help you to promote your book here, if you're reflecting. This morning, we have a, a dear sister here, and I'm going to let her introduce herself and tell her about this book. The one reason she's writing this book, she's a missionary all her life, but the reason I got it here, really, because it's a good book, but number, but, but number two is because she, these are stories of missionaries, and she got me as one of them. Okay. Loving. Are you hearing me? Yes. Yeah. With Wycliffe Bible Translators. I come today to represent the book and a book. The book, Dr. John says that I can't preach because he's going to preach. But I could, he didn't say I couldn't read to you from the book. <laughs> oh. You're not understanding that. I can tell you're not understanding that. Um, that was a language in Papua New Guinea, on the island of New Guinea, north of Australia, where my husband and I worked uh, for many, many years. We've been uh, missionaries for over 50 years with Wycliffe. I'd like to give you a couple of scenarios. Today, you are sitting in the 2008 CCDA conference here in America. Suddenly, the doors burst open. Enter men in uniforms. They go around at gunpoint, demand that each of you give your Bible that they will take away and destroy. The second scenario, you live on a little island in the South Pacific, a little island of New Guinea. You are there, and you have never heard the name of Jesus. Now, your ancestors told you that uh, someone created everything, but he's up there now, and when he gets angry, he shakes the world, and when he gets really angry, he roars and throws down darts of fire. When you die, you become a ghost to come back and torment your family. You've never heard the name of Jesus. Never. Well, except, come by my book table, and I will tell you that. Today, there are churches there because God called my husband and me to go. I have written a book called Together We Can, a mosaic of stories and devotions. 31 devotionals. A mosaic of stories and devotions displaying the impact of God's word. Forward by a man that I dearly love, and many of you dearly love him too. Dr. John Perkins. 
just a word or two here from his forward. Mission is on the heart of our Lord Jesus. He obeyed and came down to reach people like you and me who were lost and lacking love. Just before he returned to his father, he told his followers to go and make disciples of all nations. What you are doing, most of you here today, is wonderful, wonderful. But it's one nation. I know a few more are represented, praise God. Mission is on the heart of the Holy Spirit. He changes our desires, even our minds, so we can understand God's word and then become witnesses in Jerusalem, that's important, and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Mission is at the heart of the Bible. Come by Dr. John's table and have a look at Together We Can. Not just have a look, but to buy. Okay. Thank you. Uh, every, everybody, every person need a mentor, somebody to walk by their side. And in my life, I've been fortunate. The old Presbyterian minister uh, who discipled me when I was first converted. And I've had others, uh, Mama Wilson and Hattie James, and these are older people in my life. I've always had Mr. Buckley. They have been people in my life and who speak into my life. And every one of you need a mentor in your life. And for the last 10 years now, uh, Laura Noble and I, he has been my mentor in terms of my work. He has wrote a wonderful book. This book really reflects what we talk about most of the time. He talks about the kingdom of God and about justice and oppression. And he has also written a book. And would you tell us a word about your book? Thank you, John. Is this on? Can be turned on? Okay. Is this on? All right. Yeah. The term hot off the press has new meaning to me. <laughs> this book, From Oppression to Jubilee Justice, came into my hands yesterday afternoon, just in time for this conference. From Oppression to Jubilee, Justice is built around Luke 4, 18 and 19. Four crucial concepts there. The spirit, the poor, the oppressed, and Jubilee Justice. Since my wife and I retired in 94, we've been volunteering at the John Perkins Foundation in Jackson, Mississippi about nine months out of each year. First, we worked with Spencer Perkins and Chris Rice, after Spencer's tragic death, John and Vera May took over and we worked with them and now we're working with Elizabeth Perkins there. I was a typical white middle class evangelical for the first 20 years of my Christian life into a personal sin, personal salvation gospel based on the cross and the resurrection but had little understanding of social oppression and social justice. Then Martin Luther King was assassinated in April of 68. Somehow the Holy Spirit used that tragic event to shock me. It was like a searchlight shone down from heaven and I saw America plagued by the horror of racism, the horror of oppression. So I've been on a pilgrimage since 1968, first to understand oppression biblically, historically, and sociologically and then justice. I'd like to, since King was so influential in my life, I'd like to read just a short excerpt from one of King's speeches, a speech he gave in December of 1967. This was, of course, after his I Have a Dream speech in 1963 and after the civil rights legislation had been passed. So it was about four months before his death. So we all know King for his I Have a Dream speech. This is his I Live a Nightmare speech. In 1963 in Washington, D.C., I tried to talk to the nation about a dream I had had. And I must confess that not long after talking about that dream, I started to see it turn into a nightmare, just a few weeks after I had talked about it. It was when four beautiful Negro girls were murdered in a church in Birmingham, Alabama. 
I watched that dream turn into a nightmare as I moved through the ghettos of the nation and saw black brothers and sisters perishing on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. And I saw the nation doing nothing to grapple with the Negro's problem of poverty. I saw that dream turned into a nightmare as I watched my black brothers and sisters in the midst of anger and understandable outrage, in the midst of their hurt, in the midst of their disappointment, turn to misguided riots to try to solve that problem. I saw that dream turned into a nightmare as I watched the war in Vietnam escalating. Yes, I am personally a, the victim of deferred dreams of blasted hopes. So this book is an attempt to kind of fill in some of that gap that King saw and recognized that we as a nation had not addressed some of the fundamental problems. Civil rights legislation, important and necessary, accomplished a lot, but King saw we needed a revolution of values and a transformation of society. So this is my attempt to address some of those issues. Thank you. You can also pick that book up at my uh, at my booth there thank you all so very much let's pray father thank you that we can be together here this morning now bless our time as we go into your word to study your word we ask this in jesus name amen if you have your bible you should open them to the book of habakkuk for the next morning, we're going to study the book of Habakkuk. Uh, we are studying the book of Habakkuk because I really believe that we, within our evangelical church in particular, that we have misunderstood uh, the Great Commission. That the Great Commission was to go into all the world and disciple the nation and evangelism would be an effect of well discipled people going out living the Christian life we have now put evangelism out there first and we have over evangelized the world too lightly and the world is defining Christianity around their own will around their own imagination and that we are no longer looking at it from the book and from the life of Christ and the Old Testament prophet, we are now doing what is right in our own eyes. And we have organized for ourselves a superficial, mean prosperity Christianity. We need to come back to biblical Christianity. Biblical Christianity. Uh, we are living in the days like Habakkuk lived. And so what I want to do these next few days is that I want to sort of like internalize Habakkuk. I want to be the Habakkuk. I want to, I, my mind, my heart is broke like Habakkuk's heart was broke. He was perplexed. He was confused. He, he was looking around him and seeing the society and could see that it didn't, look anything like what Moses had intended the nation to be. And so they was looking out for themselves. They was seeking for a personal blessing in their life. And what we want to do now is to go back, and this is the whole idea of CCDA, is that we go back and anchor our faith in the Word of God. Our faith begins in the word of God. The Bible says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith is, is believing what God said in his word he would do. That's what faith is. And that's why the just then shall live by faith. Uh, we have to live in obedience to the word of God. You know, I, there's a passage in the book of Hebrews. I'm going to come back here. <laughs> There's a passage in the book of Hebrews that says that God, who at sun time yesterday, in time past, spoken to our fathers 
by the prophet. But in these last days has spoken to us by his son. What was the prophet? The prophets was the representatives of God's word incarnated in a person, although it was temporary. And so God moved up on the prophet. And the prophet had to speak that which God had told them so that the people could know how to live. And so the Old Testament idea is that the prophets were sort of like the incarnation of the word of God. Even some false prophets uh, like Balaam said, I can't preach nothing but what God has told me to speak. And so the prophet would come when the nation was in crisis, the prophet would appear and the idea of the prophet was to bring the people back to the word of God, bring them back to the foundation. What are we? What is how it work today in the church? Well, the Bible is very clear on this, that Jesus Christ was the incarnated word of God. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, the word. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. And this word became flesh and dwelt among us. Uh, the word of God is what we live by. In obedience to the word of God. And so today, today, Jesus was incarnated God here on earth. And the prophets and the and the apostles have carved out for us the word of God. We call this then the word of God. This is a book for living. This is a textbook for life. This is more than an inspirational book. This book is how we should live. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for correction in righteousness so that the people of God may be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And so we got to come back now and begin to live. Look at the word of God and adjust our life according to the word of God. I believe that God will do something in our life if we are living in obedience to his word. In obedience to his word. And so what we have here then in, in the book of Habakkuk, he's looking out at the situation of his day. He's seeing that people are not living by it. And because of that, God is getting ready now to raise up the Babylonian as his disciplined hand in their life. And they're going to go into Babylon for 70 years because they didn't follow the measuring point of whether or not they were living right was how they dealt with the Sabbath. The Sabbath was the mirror. And he had told them every 50 years there was to be justice in the land, and that would be restorative justice. People would go back to their land, their farm, if they was in debt, and they could start all over again. That was the measuring point of whether or not they was doing justice. There is no record during those 500 or so years they was in the land, there is no record where they ever, as a nation, had the jubilee. And so they disobeyed it. There was people who practiced that from time to time the best they knew how. People like Boaz and others. But as a whole nation, they didn't practice justice. Because they tramped over God's justice, and because they sold the poor for a pair of shoes, and that's, that's the prophets came, and people like Amos came and tried to call them back to the word of God, but they wouldn't come back to the word of God. And because of that, he's going to carry them into captivity for 70 years. And this is looming now during this man's time. He's seeing the violence of his nation, and he's asking God questions. Uh, I call Habakkuk had a question mark for a mind, for a brain. All he's doing is asking God's question. Asking God. Habakkuk is a, is, a, is, a, is a person who desired to be righteous. I, I would like to do that. I would like to try to do that. And I, I sort of know how you can possibly do a little of that righteousness. If you would just use First uh, John 1, 9 in your life, if you be conscious of your sin, and when you recognize that you are sinning, confessing your sin before God, and confessing your wrongs to each other, 
And that's the way we stay in relationship with God as we confess our sin. That's the way you live righteous. Because if you say you have no sin, you have deceived yourself. And the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I want to be righteous. I want to be righteous, you, you know. Okay, so Habakkuk. So Habakkuk. Let's look at, let's take a look then at Habakkuk here. And this will be what I can do this morning is really introduce you to this wonderful, wonderful prophet here. And uh, let's then, let me read then. Uh, the first part of Habakkuk here. Let me read it to you so you can hear it. The burden which Habakkuk, the prophet, did see. Maybe i just go verse by verse. Uh, the burden which Habakkuk, the prophet, did see. Now what is, what does this mean? Uh, the Bible says without a vision the people perish. What is a Biblical vision. Biblical vision is to look out and see the situation as God sees it. As God sees it. That's a vision. They call the Old Testament prophet, they call him the seal. They call him the seal because he had had a vision from God. And when, when time was tough, they'd go with the prophet and say, what did the prophet see? What did the prophet see? This is the burden here that the prophet did see. Now, God is going to talk to this prophet, and that's what makes him a prophet. And, and the prophet is going to say what God said to the people. That's the prophet. If a prophet didn't say what God was saying to the people, they had the right to stone him. If, if it didn't come true what the prophet was saying, they had the right to put that to that. And so he was to speak what God has said, and this meant that he'd have a vision. That's why Solomon can say, without a vision, the people perish. Yeah. I hear a lot of people today, and they take it too casually for me. I meet people, and they're telling me what God told them to tell me. And, 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 and today I hear people walking around, and they're talking so casually about God, like God is speaking to them all day long. And God is telling them what to tell somebody else in, in, in life. In the Bible, when one, when God spoke to a person, it was serious. That, that person was shaking. That person was on the ground. That person was pulling off their shoes. When God speaks to you, he speaks to you about something that is very, very important. And, and when God speaks to you, it's not just about you. It's about the society that he wants to see healed. And all this personal, God told me he's going to give me a car. God told me he's going to do this. God told me he's going to do this. God ain't telling you that. When God speaks to you, it's not tell you. When God speaks to you, it is the burden that the prophet did see. It is the burden that the prophet did see. Jesus came and he spoke to us. What he spoke to us really is about is, is his death. And he had to live his whole life out here on earth with that burden. And then he said to me, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. My, my, burden, my burden is heavy, but my, my yoke is light. And so when God tell us something, when he's putting a burden on us, he's putting a concern for the people. I'm concerned about all leadership. I'm concerned about the, the billionaires that are being made today and the poverty and the suffering in the world. I, I'm concerned about us black people who are becoming successful. And it's so busy moving away from my own people and seeing that our race is in danger. Our race is in danger. Boy, one of our board members spoke to us the other day. Uh, spoke to us about AIDS and says today the highest carrier of AIDS in America is a black woman. And these black women is being 
this aid is being transferred to them by the black men. On one hand, we got black men killing themselves and black men going to prison. And I know all of the causes of that. All the causes of that. I don't have time for that. But boy, we getting it on both ends. The black woman has been the stability of our society. And that has been since slavery. It has been the black woman that have upheld us as a people in this country. We must know that. It was a black old 70-year-old woman took me when my mother died and nurtured me. She had had 19 children of her own. And she nurtured me and she nurtured my other cousin in society. And now we are, we are killing each other. It is in our society. The highest cause of death in my community is a young black man killing another young black man in our society. And now we are infecting the women with aid. And this is another dangerous thing I'm seeing. One of the dangerous things I'm seeing is the amount of black men now who are killing black women. Oh, man. And where is the church? Where is that concern? Where is that neighborhood? Where is that community where we can nurture? And, and these young black men is not wanting to get married. They don't see taking care of a woman, my greatest virtue in life. And I tell her that, I remind her that all the time. For 56 years, I have taken care of this lady here. That, that's my responsibility. She done give me a heritage. She give me 13 kids and a great grandkid. And 13 grandkids, eight kids, eight kids. I can, uh, she always, she always bragging about she's such a good woman. Uh, I'm, I'm really putting you up there. Eight kids, eight kids and 13 grand, grandkids. That's my heritage. And I have a great grandson. How could a person be more happy than that? In life. And uh, let me get back to my. <laughs> this is the burden. This is the burden. This is the burden that the prophet did see. This is the burden. We need more people with, with, with burden. I like what Bill Hybers said, what is a leader? Bill Hybers defines a leader. Bill Hybers says a leader is a person who can turn vision into passion and be passionate about something. Most people are passionate for themselves. They're passionate about what they can buy in our community. In my community, you go, uh, about six blocks in my community, and I could show you 20 payday loans in my neighborhood. We are not, it's not no longer instant gratification. We don't went past that. We are paying for the gratification that we've already had in our society. This is the burden, this is the burden that the prophet did see. And these churches are getting bigger and bigger, and I'm glad the more people coming into the kingdom. But are we engaging these people in discipleship? That what we are doing is reducing the church down to their will. We are, we are reducing the church down to meeting their need. And people meet me all the time and say, this church is not meeting my need. The church don't exist to meet your need. The church exists to meet the will of God. It's to do God's will. And God's will is good for you. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the things that we need will be added. God has a supernatural prosperity plan. And his supernatural prosperity plan is to do his will, not your own. Not your own. I, I say that we have... Uh, these naming and claimants done hijack prayer. <laughs> I, I listen at them. It goes something like this. Oh, say, can you see what's in it for me? <laughs> God, what are you going to bless me with today? The prayer ought to be, God, how are we going to implement your will? That your kingdom will come. That your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's our prayer. This is the burden, this is the burden which the prophet did see. Let's look at him now and listen to his burden. Y'all heard mine, my burden. 
I, I, I'm thrilled with what we are doing. I, I'm thrilled that when I meet with people this morning, I met with some people from Columbus who is building a school, have built a school, an elite school right in the hood. And I've been to that hood. And I have watched the poverty and the death. And for these boys, I used to go there. Most of those guys in jail are dead. Now they are building a school in that hood. That's what we had to do in Pasadena. We had to rescue some of them. Right now, we are, we are concerned about not only building schools, but we are concerned about the public schools. Uh, we are going to do in Memphis, we are developing a college there. It's called Crichton's College. We're going to train Christians to go into the public school. Boy, I'm so excited about that. Because all of us uh, simple evangelicals are talking about God that been put out of the school. That's so simple. That, that people can order God around. That's so simple. And, 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 and you can't have God in the school. That's too simple. God incarnates himself in his people. And where two or three meet together in his name, God is there in power. And so we train some teachers and put those teachers in the public school. We're going to rescue some of our people. I am for the Christian school. I'm for the private school. Uh, we shouldn't leave everything by chance. We should be raising up leaders in that community. But we can't leave all 98% uh, of our people behind to fill up the prison in our community. And so we're going to hear more about that school. We want you to send you, come there from all over the nation. We want you to go there. We want you to send your people there to Crichton College. Send them there where they can get a holistic view in the development of the curriculum there that's going to teach them how to navigate the system and help them understand the Constitution. And so that we don't have to go in there and just use these biblical words all the time, but go in there and live it out. And then you're going to be able to share your life with those kids there and mentor them in, in our society. This is the burden. This is the burden. Let's listen now at the burden. Let's listen at the burden that the prophet did see. This is the burden which Habakkuk, the prophet, did see. You got mine. Now let's go and look at his burden. He says to God, how long, O Lord, shall I cry and you will not hear? I like that. How long will I cry? He sees his people. The Babylonian captivity, he's going to get an answer from God. And the answer he's going to get from God is that he's going to raise up these Chaldees and, and he's going to use them as his disciplined agent to bring his people back to God. This is not going to satisfy him. You're going to see that. This is not going to satisfy him. This is what's got him so mixed up. But right now he's looking out at his own people. And he's crying out to them and he's saying, Lord, how long? How long? You can see that prayer is not enough. I mean, real prayer is, Lord, what would you have me to do? That's real prayer. That's real prayer, you, you know. Uh, so, oh, Lord, how long shall I cry and you will not hear? Ever crying unto thee of the violence in our society. The violence in my society in Philadelphia, I went there 35 or 40 years ago. And I knew that Philadelphia had the highest intellectual, intelligent black people in America. There's no doubt about it. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. But what done happened there, most of those black people, many of them, have moved over into Jersey and have moved out to out of suburbia. And they have left those thousands of people there without the moral flavor and without the old people there to transfer these, these moral values to the young folks. And this year already, over 300 black young people have killed other black young people in that city. It is now the murder capital. And in my city in Jackson, that little city, it is, it is a death. Uh, every two days, there is a death in my city. There is violence and there is robbery in our city. And the pushing of drugs and of crime in our city, in our city. And this is only coming from a small population. 
we could attack this problem. We could attack this problem if the suburbia churches and all the churches, even the suburbia black churches and the suburbia white congregation and all of them would get together and target it on the problem. We could solve the problem. At least we could be a witness to that community. But we're neglecting it and we're looking for a reason not to do it. Reason not to do it, not to be involved. And we, we talk about reconciliation and the one church to white folks, that's basically just drinking coffee together in the community. What we're talking really about is how do we get together for mission? How do we come to get together to solve the problems in the neighborhood? That's what we got to do. That's what we got to do. We all gonna pay. We all gonna pay. The highest expenses we have in my county, the highest expenses of all expenses that we have in expenses is what we give to the prison justice system. It costs more to keep them in prison than to send them to Harvard. So it's not a matter of paying. It ain't a matter of paying. It's just who you want to pay. And now these guys, these investors are getting smart. And what they're doing now is that they are now organizing these private prisons and putting them on the stock exchange. And you can know they're going to lobby all of the senators and congressmen so that they can get more money for the prisoners and they're going to get more money. They're going to make money on our misery in our society. It's a waste. It's a waste. Prison is a judgment upon a society. Prison, it says that we fail them. We fail them. And we got to lock them up. And we are failing ours but because we're not surrounding them in those communities and transferring these Christian values to those people. We need mentors. We need people in, this, in the ghetto to come along beside us and mentor the people. If you'd ask me what you can do this morning, if, if, if I need it, and if I need it, I do need it. If I was going to ask you for $1,000 and you're going to come and mentor with me, a $10,000, you know what I'd say? Come and mentor. Come and mentor, because I would end up getting $1,000 anyway. <laughs> but you are more important than your money. You made your money. You made your money. You are more important than that in the community. Let me see, can I get another verse here? <laughs> the violent. He's crying out for violence. And look what he says to God. Why does thou show me iniquity? and cause me to be whole grievously. And he said, spoiling and violent are before me. And there are they that raise up strife and contentment. That's what we gotta be careful with. We get careful, we don't start arguing about something that's not important. I mean, we're arguing about something not important. We, we, we are arguing about things that don't matter. We need to see the problem. I think unless we can zero people in on the problem, unless you can give people a cause, and the cause now is the life and the death of our people. My cause now is to not to see all of our black young women die of AIDS. Because, you see, these black young women can't find no decent husband. And, and they now have to use multiple men uh, to satisfy their need in society. Because if a black girl gets to be a college graduate and come back to the community and is not an immoral girl, where's she going to find a husband? It's becoming very hard in our society. And so, and we are talking about something else. We are talking about something else. We are arguing about something else. I remember when I worked on getting the first health center, first one in America, uh, uh, the Ford Foundation asked us to experiment with how could we get health care to those children. And I said, oh, let's go into the school. And they gave us money to pioneer that. I couldn't tell my evangelical friends that. I couldn't tell them that because along with them, uh, providing they, they was trying to prevent, they saw the biggest problem in the medical center was that the girl was getting venereal disease. And the biggest problem in there, the girls were becoming pregnant at 14 and 15 years old. And they wanted to get their hands around that. 
to get their hands around what was causing it in the community. And then my evangelical friend said, you don't do that. You don't do that. And we get caught up. We're arguing about something that don't count. We, we should be totally pro-life. We should be pro-life for the ones that's not born and pro-life for the ones that's born. And most of my pro-life people are just for those who are not born yet. They, they are talking about the feeder. They are talking about all the research and all of that. They are talking about that. I'm concerned about that, but I'm also concerned about these that are alive now in the community that are suffering. We got to get some balance to this thing. Get some balance to this thing. My pro-life people, I'm pro-life and I'm all of that. I'm evangelical to the core. Uh, but do we have a pro-life candidate that's going to win in the Republican Party? Where is our moral values? What happened to them? In just a few years, what? do we have a president with running that's got integrity in our society that haven't been married a couple of times? Yeah, we got one or two. But boy, they are not heaven the pole. The ones who are heaven the pole have been the ones who've had two and three wives in our society. I I'm telling you, don't be manipulated by the politician, whether they're Democrats or Republican. We need to come back and give our attention to getting into these communities and beginning to put our resources at the problems in these neighborhoods. Let's continue here. Why do you show me this violence? Why is this violence before me? And why is so much strife and contentment? That's what I'm getting at now, this strife and contentment. We are fighting about something that don't count. We are fighting about something that don't count. We need to get into that community and we become the solution in those neighborhoods. We organize clinics in that community. We help the people in those neighborhoods. Look what it says here. Therefore, boy, this is the lobbyist. Therefore, the law is slight. Let me see that. Therefore, the law is slight. And judgment of justice does never go forth. Listen to that. Justice does never go forth. It don't go forth because the wicked is surrounding the righteous. Therefore, justice do not come forth. It's going to cost a uh, hundred and fifty million dollars to be any one of the candidates. It's going to take three hundred million for any one of them to become president. Who is going to surround these guys? Where is this resources coming from? The wicked is going to surround the righteous. And they, and here it was, the wicked, the righteous here, is the people who are, are the judges. The, the, the righteous here is the gatekeepers. The, the righteous here is the people who ought to be in charge, our politicians. You, you understand? And what we have now is all of this money surrounding all of these candidates. And we're going to end up with the best president that money can buy in our society. And then we're going to be walking around here in the streets talking about them. Take your eyes off of them. And let's put our eyes back in the neighborhood, back in the community. Let's elect some local officials, people we can talk to. Let's be concerned about them. Let's vote. Of course let's vote. Vote for any one of the presidents you want to vote for. It don't make any difference. Okay, any one. Don't make any difference. Because all of them is going to be surrounded by the wicked. In our society. Let me close this here. My time is gone. This zero is blinking here uh, <laughs> before me. I think that as far as we can go, let's come back tomorrow morning and let's get back in. What you got this morning is, is his vision. You got his vision and you got my vision. My vision. He's, he was seeing the same thing in his day. The end of Injustice is how we behave sexually. Whenever God gets ready to judge a society, it's not because necessarily of the sex behavior that God judges. But the sex 
behavior is the most gratifying part of the humanity. You get that idea? And when God got ready to judge, this judge judgment is this, as it was in the days of Sodom, the sexual behavior wasn't Sodom's problem. Sodom's problem was they neglected the poor. But they used that neglect for self-gratification. As it was in the days of Noah. As it was. As it was. God's judgment. And you can trace now. You can trace now. But well, I'm going to get to that tomorrow. Uh, I, I, I think God might be raising up, or have raised up, or allowed Al-Qaeda to speak to us. Might have allowed a nation more wicked than us to speak to us. A at least they don't want the women to be props for the sale of our products. We don't want, uh, they don't want the women to be undressed to sell the products. And our biggest entertainment now is undressed beautiful ladies in the public. And, 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 and uh, Ben Laden is saying we ought to cover them up. We ought to cover them up. And all that we are talking about, if you trace it all down, you're going to end up with 97% of the prison come from a broken family. In my neighborhood, 84% of the children are being raised without a father in home in our society. It is our non-commitment to our wives. It is a non-commitment. The greatest forceful thing that we are to get together and do together to death do us apart. That was for the sake of the children. That was for the sake of the children in our society. What's broken in our society is the family and the community. What we gotta fix? We gotta fix the community first because the family is already broke. We got to fix the community then as we fix the family. We got to go back to our communities and we got to build a, a infrastructure that values children, that values women, that values motherhood above all things in the community. That's what we got to go back and we got to fix that within our community. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you that you have brought your people here. And over the next few mornings that we can have this discussion about real issues. But most of all, Lord, that we be looking into your Bible and that we be listening to you and that we be taking our cues from you. We want to live out your word. We want to be your word incarnated in our heart. And, and that we recognize the fact that, uh, that the word need to be a light unto our feet and a lamp unto our path as we go along. Bless the rest of this. Lord, And we know now that this is really a pep talk. Uh, the real work comes after this, these workshops. These people who've been out there on the field doing the work, Lord, uh, who was out there, they are coming. And, and, and Lord, be with them. Be with each workshop leader. Uh, Lord, help them not, and them not just to sell themselves. But Lord, help them to see the word and to see what they're doing. Uh, write the vision. Make it plain this morning. So bless these workshops. We ask this in Jesus' precious name and for his sake. Amen. Hold it, 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 hold it. I will be untrue to myself. I won't sleep no more tonight if I don't do this. My greatest book that have had the, one of the greatest impact on Christian community development is my new edition. Revived edition, it's just off the press here, it's with justice for all. Go by our booth, pick it up, and enjoy it. And then, of course, if you haven't got the updated edition of Let Justice Roll Down, then take these two and you got a library. You got a library. Thank you so much. We didn't do bad. <laughs>